days. Um, this is something we started at Lenox Hill, um, formerly in person, when we were allowed to actually meet in person. And our goal was to bring topics to the community that are important for heart health and really engage our patients and bring this back to their families and to everyone to improve health. So thank you for joining us tonight. We are really excited uh, about the topic that we have to offer you. Um, it is your exercise prescription, heart and brain health. Um, something that's really important and I think we just don't hear enough about um, the details of that. Um, and joining us tonight to discuss this is our own uh, colleague and good friend, Dr. Benjamin Hirsch, who is the Director of Preventive Cardiology and also the Director of the Cardiac Rehab Center uh, for Sanja Atlas ba Bass Hospital in Manhasset uh, through our Northwell Health System. Um, and we will be discussing various um, aspects of exercise throughout the night. So at any point that you have a question, please just put it right into the chat box. Um, this way we can address all of the questions you may have. Um, and there is no question, you know, ask whatever you want about exercise. We all want to learn tonight um, about what we can be doing better. Um, so Dr. Hirsch will be reviewing with us the benefits of exercise and even giving us some pointers on how to fit this in. So maybe we'll start with a question for the audience, sort of get people's perspective on uh, exercise and what they know to date, at least on the benefits and everything. So can we get that question for the audience? All right, so if you can enter your vote, so regular exercise can one day result in glowing and radiant skin, the ability to save the world with your newly developed strength and agility, increased wealth based on increased ability to focus, improve productivity, being the life of the party from reduced levels of depression, anxiety, or all of the above. So we're gonna give you a couple of seconds to answer this very serious question of ours, <laughs> which is very crucial. And we'll be getting a lot of facts here on this. Um, so we'd love to see your thoughts on this. Go right ahead and uh, enter your responses. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to vote on this one, but I'm very much eager to see what your responses are. So. All right, I'll have to give you the answer. Essentially, the answer is in fact all of the above. Okay, some of them are far-fetched, but let's be honest, if you manage to exercise and you feel great and you look good and you're thinking clearly and your heart's functioning well, you probably could do all of those things. So let's hear more from Dr. Hirsch about this. Thank you. So you just have to unmute yourself actually, Ben. I know we, we silenced you before, but... <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Giannis, and thank you uh, for letting me contribute. Uh, this, is, uh, this is really terrific, and I, I really hope you all find my suggestions uh, very helpful. I, I really think that that question and uh, answer was, uh, was really right on, the, right on the button. I don't think you guys need to listen to any more, but, but I'll give you a, a couple more pointers. So, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Dr. Benjamin Hirsch. I, I currently direct the uh, the cardiac rehabilitation program in Great Neck, and uh, as well as uh, the co I'm the co-director of the Lipid Center. Uh, it's a cholesterol center also in Great Neck. Today, I'm going to be speaking about exercise, uh, which and and how really it improves um, um, your heart and your brain uh, throughout your lifespan. So we so as we get into exercise, the first thing we I want to touch on is that our number one enemy that we're trying to get rid of with exercise is atherosclerosis, which is basically just plaque. Um, and uh, so with, as with everything in a healthy lifestyle, that's our number one enemy. And, and I just want to keep that in mind. We'll talk about seven simple steps to, to kind of combat this enemy of ours. We'll talk about actually sitting, the act of sitting and how it can affect your heart disease risk and actually your longevity. And then we'll get into the specifics about how um, exercise specifically uh, reduces your cardiovascular risk. And uh, even amongst those with and without uh, heart disease. 
Today we'll talk about heart uh, exercise in the brain and uh, and how it can improve uh, not only cognition but it can reduce the chance of developing uh, neurodegenerative diseases such as uh, such as Alzheimer's, uh, as well as uh, the effects it has on on mood and and emotional well-being. Then we'll talk about what's a formal exercise prescription. So what does the American Heart Association uh, and the American College of Sports Medicine recommend that we all do? And then how do we individualize that? Is it ever unsafe to exercise? Is it necessary to exercise? Those are some of the really important questions that I want you guys to take away from this talk. And then I'll touch on some of the, the structured programs that we use to help people in the community such as yourselves uh, get involved in, in exercise-based programs. And then what do we do now in the midst of a pandemic in terms of exercise and, and how can we find ways to be active uh, during COVID? So as I said, atherosclerosis is the, the enemy. It's, it starts uh, when you're born and, uh, and it, is the con it is basically the deposition of plaque in all of your arteries. That includes the arteries around your heart uh, surround, or supplying your heart, as well as the artery supplying every organ, including your liver, um, your feet, and then all the way up to your brain. And we're trying to prevent the buildup of plaque. And one of the ways we can do that is by living a healthy lifestyle. And one of the most important aspects of a healthy lifestyle is actually exercising. As cardiologists and, and, and as, as practitioners, clinicians, we, we often dichotomize patients into whether or not uh, we're treating them for primary prevention or secondary prevention. Primary prevention patients are patients who have not had an event, but may be at high risk for an event, such as uh, those with diabetes, high cholesterol. And those who are secondary prevention patients have had a heart attack or stroke. And even though we separate patients into this, we're still fighting that same enemy of atherosclerosis. So no matter what, you will always benefit from exercising, from these, from these, uh, these strategies uh, that are um, these health, these health, healthy, you know, longevity strategies, including uh, eating right and exercising. They're all going to provide benefits throughout your lifespan, even if you've already had an event or have not had an event. So as a segue, basically, we define ideal cardiovascular health as, as being either someone who has never smoked or has quit smoke, smoking, has a BMI or body mass index less than 25. Uh, again, physical activity, so moderate to vigorous physical activity greater than 75 min minutes per week, uh, meeting four of the five healthy diet goals, having a total cholesterol less than 200, blood pressure less than 120 over 80, and a fasting blood glucose less than 100. When, when they followed patients who had achieved all of these metrics, they and followed them for 20 years, they saw that there was a 0.05% chance that they would have a cardiovascular event, such as a heart attack. Now, when they followed patients who achieved none of these, which is really probably 99% of the population. Uh, it's actually, it actually is in 2015, it was about 98 to 99% of the population. They, uh, they saw that, um, that that risk was almost 100 fold at 5%. So you can see how really the, the benefits of, of living a healthy lifestyle that incorporates all of these elements is, is really essential to to reduce your risk, and that that is the core of prevention, and uh, and even more so than medication. Now, when you look at all of these different uh, cardiovascular health metrics, what you recognize is that exercise can really lower or allow you to reach many of these. It can lower your body mass index. It can help you be, uh, you know, it can help you uh, eat less or binge less an unhealthy snack, or your cholesterol, and lower your blood pressure, and, and lower your glucose. So it's really an, a core component of these cardiovascular health measures. So when we look at, at the population, um, 
we and when we look at evolution, we we really we've gone from being hunter gatherers, being physically active, to now being sedentary and being smart and efficient through technology, but also being very inactive, and that's led to uh, a really devastating blow to our to our health. And we're just starting to recognize that as more and more data comes out. So what is it that sitting or, or being less active does? So it can call, it can trigger inflammation, it can worsen your vascular function, it can worsen metabolism. And without getting into to too many of the details, worsening metabolism leading to ele elevations in triglycerides, elevations and things that lead to triglycerides and, and, and LDL. It can reduce your response to, uh, to meals, your insulin response, and lead to prediabetes. And it can, it, it can cause increases in fatty deposits and the, and the tissues uh, and your organs, such as a fatty liver. So here's a study where they looked at 1.5 million patients from different that were that were com comprised of uh, papers from different studies, and they looked at their level of uh, of sedentary time or sitting, and and actually longevity. And if you look at the the x-axis or the, the horizontal axis, as you go from the furthest right, you'll see that you have the most inactive patients, and you'll see that they have the the greatest uh, decrease in longevity or, or reduce or increase mortality. And then you see that as you go along this x-axis towards the left or, uh, or you have increase in physical activity, they wanted to look at whether or not you could blunt that effect of sitting for prolonged periods uh, with exercise. And what they found uh, was that Really, you, 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 it was only for people who are kind of have moderate to vig vigorous levels of exercise who really blunted that effect. So sitting really is a major risk factor for heart disease. And so as we mentioned, it, it can really increase that risk of heart disease, uh, you know, a two, twofold increase in heart disease, uh, 30 to 40% reduced risk um, for the most active individuals. And this is uh, consistent across age, uh, gender, and, and ethnicity. Annette Winger uh, is uh, one of the most uh, preeminent ph physicians of our time, preeminent car cardiologists and physicians. And she really kind of led the, the movement uh, towards women's heart health and, and much of prevention that we, we now practice. And she's a really big proponent of exercise and its health. And she said that exercise is viewed as a preventive medical treatment, like a pill that should be taken on an almost daily basis. But why is that? Well, exercise improves vascular function and reduces inflammation and improves metabolism, reduces appetite. And we see that translate to improvements in cholesterol profile, improvements in blood pressure, reduction in obesity, improvements in quality of life, less stress, less earth to smoke, and then ultimately reduction in heart disease risk, reduction in, in the incidence of many different types of cancer, and then again, greater survival and, and less hospitalization. So how much exercise do we really need to do? So this study uh, looked at a number of patients uh, and their mortality risk or their, or how long they, or their longevity. And on the x-axis is just increasing amounts of physical activity as you go from the left to the right. And here on the leftmost part of the figure, you can see that mortality is the greatest for those who are completely sedentary. But what you also see is that any physical activity from that point dramatically reduces that risk. So the greatest or the steepest part of that curve or the greatest benefit that you get is when you go from being sedentary to physically active. So 
any activity is better than no activity. And yes, you get progressive benefits uh, to or towards greater longevity as you become more active up to a certain point. But again, the greatest benefits come as you start to go from no physical activity to increasing levels of physical activity. And we see exercise improve uh, a number of different aspects of, uh, of cardiology. When in, in terms of patients with atrial fibrillation, uh, when they showed, when they randomized patients to a, a uh, to a programmatic uh, based exercise pro, uh, exercise prescription uh, for weight loss, they saw that they had a reduction in the uh, number of episodes of symptomatic atrial fibrillation and less hospitalizations for, for atrial fibrillation and less ablations for atrial fibrillation. So it really is uh, is is dramatically improving uh, our management of atrial fibrillation. In addition, for patients who have congestive heart failure, so when you think of patients with reduced heart function, it, you, you don't necessarily, you know, the lay person may not realize that they can exercise sometimes just as much, if not more, than patients who have normal heart function. And in fact, when they did uh, a program to exercise uh, uh, regimen for these patients, they saw that they had uh, Im improved or, or increased longevity and less hospitalization. When should we be exercising? So most people think that after they have a heart attack, they should allow their body to rest. And in fact, that was really the case for a number of different medical conditions, but exactly the opposite. It's really the time when you should start to, to, uh, to turn the corner and adopt a new way of living. And the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehabilitation say that exercise should begin as early as one week after discharge, unless you have symptomatic valvular heart disease, congenital heart disease that prohibits exercising, decompensated heart failure, or other morbid conditions such as chronic obstructive pulmonary that could be exacerbated by exercising. So it's, it's, you really don't have too many excuses not to start some form of exercise program. And it's really a critical component of recovery and treatment uh, for uh, patients who have sustained uh, a heart attack. Now, that being said, there are certain limitations for, for people, for patients. And and they have to be taken into consideration. And that's why we encourage patients to enroll in these more structured programs such as cardiac rehabilitation, where we take into, where we take into uh, or account for comorbidities and, and physical limitations. So how about the brain? So we've talked about how it affects the heart, but, but you know, Heart function and, and heart health and, and brain function and brain health are, are very uh, intimately linked to our habits. So with, when it comes to physical activity, our brain function improves cognition and improves memory. Uh, it reduces dementia or the likelihood of developing dementia and even improves the quality of life for those with dementia. And it reduces the risk of stroke, as well as improving our emotional well-being. Of course, there's a number of studies that show that different areas of the brain um, light up on imaging uh, uh, before and, uh, or after exercise compared to someone who has not exercised. So what does it do specifically to improve cognitive function? Well, there's development of new blood cells. There's improvement in the connections between existing uh, neurons or brain cells. And even with brief exercises, such as an, uh, exercising for 20 minutes, you can see improvements in the information processing and memory. And, and again, these, these different areas uh, light up on imaging uh, amongst patients who exercise and, and they begin to develop or, or you know, they begin to become more creative even after uh, bouts of exercise. So, and again, it also uh, uh, reduces um, the, the 
likelihood of developing these neurodegenerative disorders. Um, it reduces stress, which leads to reduction in cortisol and, and other types of hormones that may cause atrophy of brain tissue. It also reduces mental fatigue, so maybe writer's block. Uh, it as I said, reduces stress and improves the mood overall. It fights depression, anxiety. And we all know about the runner's high where you have that kind of bolus or infusion of endorphins after you run and allows you to be more productive, feel better. And that's important, uh, not just for, for your mood, but for your overall well-being. And then it allows us to form not just better connections between uh, brain cells, but also it improves, it allows us to generate new neurons. Uh, and this is not just for patients who are younger, it's actually for patients at all ages. So, so it allows us to, to uh, to maybe discover new things and, or think about things differently because of the fact that we're generating new neurons. So it's, it's really uh, at, at all levels that, that exercise can, can help improve brain function. So before we go on to prescribing exercising, I'm gonna let Dr. Giannis uh, uh, give you one more question. Wonderful. Um, great. That's that's really helpful. And I have to say, it reminds me of a quote that um, one of our uh, cardiologists in the Northwell Health System, Dr. Bud Zimmerman, says, you only have to exercise on the days that you eat, essentially. So making just like Nanette Wanger's beautiful quote, that's really, really great, like a pill you should take every day. I love it. So which, now I guess this one's slightly more serious than our last question, which of the following are the benefits of regular exercise, what we've learned uh, from this talk? Increased energy, weight loss, muscle building, men mental clarity, better sleep, or all of the above. So please put in your votes for this and then we'll get even more information from Dr. Hirsch. And, and there really are some very good questions that are coming in in the Q&A, so I will definitely um, feed those to Dr. Hirsch and put him on the spot as soon as we are done with the talk. No, I'm just kidding. Um, all right, so essentially the answer to that one is also all of the above, but yeah, we got some uh, good responses. Excellent, 100, 15 out of 15, everybody's got it right. All right, perfect. All right. So you'll just have to unmute again, uh, Ben, perfect. Well, thank you. So, so you're either listening to me or, or reading the slide very closely. Either way, I appreciate it. So moving on to prescribing exercise. So just before we get into prescribing exercise, I just wanted to highlight the difference between physical activity and exercise and, and why it matters. So physical activity can be literally any movement uh, that is generated by skeletal muscles. Whereas exercise, is a planned, structured, repetitive, and intentional movement intended to improve or maintain physical fitness. And again, as I was, as I was saying before, um, there's been very few people, and the majority of patients are not meeting any of the exercise standards that are recommended after a heart attack. And it's something that, that we're really trying to improve on a national level as well as in our own practice. So I keep, I keep kind of alluding to different levels of exercise, but uh, just, to, just to give you a sense of, uh, of what, uh, what type of, what light exercise means versus vigorous exercises. Light exercises, you can, you can, you can walk, you can carry, carry on a conversation very easily. Um, you don't start to sweat until 30 minutes. Whereas moderate exercises, you can carry on a conversation. It's not so easy. You start to sweat after about 15 to 20 minutes. And um, in vigorous exercise is really where it's, it's, you can't carry on a conversation. Uh, you're, you're starting to sweat after 10 minutes. And, uh, and, and that's, uh, that's kind of more high impact uh, uh, focused exercise. And the American Heart Association says that we should be exercising for at least 30 minutes, five days a week, for a total of 150 minutes, or uh, at least 25 minutes, three days a week, for a total of 75 minutes of more vigorous exercise. 
the former recommendation was moderate exercise. So, so as I say, there's, there's really no exercise prescription that applies to everyone. Now, that's a blanket recommendation, but, but as we've been talking about, really any, for, any exercise is better than no exercise, and we really need to start individualizing exercise. So, for example, these are type, different types of recommendations for patients who have osteoarthritis uh, and how they can incorporate exercise into their life um, without having to, you know, through guidance, uh, individualized guidance. And, and this is the reason that these structured programs really are important uh, to at least uh, to at least look into or or uh, to ask your physician about because they they allow you to understand what you can do even if you have limitations like low back pain or shoulder pain or knee pain uh, any of these or many other types of things that might limit your exercise or make you worried about hurting yourself further. So, so that moves us to things like, to these structured programs, such as uh, cardiac rehabilitation and, and cardiac wellness. Now, Dr. Giannis is, is very involved and Dr. Stacy Rosen are very involved in, in women's heart health where they have um, these structured programs that incorporate a number of different types of, not just exercise, but but mindfulness and, and yoga and, um, and things that reduce stress uh, in addition to, uh, to different forms of stretching. And, and that, and there's a lot, of more, a lot more data coming out about that as well. But, uh, but this is one form where, where you, can, you can do this type of exercise without any type of machine and, uh, and really does improve outcomes. I happen to have more experience with cardiac rehabilitation as the director of cardiac rehabilitation at, at, at my institution. So what we know is that this study here looked at uh, the number of patients who were discharged after having a, an acute coronary syndrome or a heart attack um, or requiring stents. And they found that those, who, those patients who, who actually participated in cardiac rehabilitation a 25% reduction in uh, in their incidence of, of or in their mortality rate. So they were, they were they had a greater longevity. And then even beyond that, those who attended more of their cardiac rehabilitation sessions actually had a better or actually had a better outcome than those who attended less. Uh, on the right, uh, we have uh, Star Jones, who's a television personality, uh, and. And she, she also went through open heart surgery. And she said that there's no question that open heart surgery saved her life, but there's also no question that cardiac rehab taught her how to live. And I really find that, that statement to be very meaningful um, as I see it a lot in, in, our, in our patients who go through cardiac re rehabilitation. So, so with all of this, you know, we're, we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic and, uh, and it's not so easy to attend a, a structured uh, cardiac rehabilitation program as now a lot of them have to be virtual. And so, so this isn't fit, this is, this is real. We can really achieve, uh, achieve things at home that can uh, allow us to start to feel better through physical activity. So some of these things uh, include, you know, breaking up your day. Um, so after 30 minutes of work, get up, set a timer and, and start to move after two minutes, walk up and down stairs, dance. You can, you can follow along to a, to some type of exercise class, like a yoga class. Uh, and you could have a standing desk. All of these types of things, um, really can start to change the way that you approach, uh, life. And, and this is a time where you can start to form new habits. You know, unfortunately, a lot of patients are are developing um, habits that were, where they're starting to gain a lot of weight because they're at home and foods all around them, and they've they've really you know gotten off a routine where they've been able to to control what they eat and and how they uh, they exercise. And now we've been kind of we've been sheltering in, literally sheltering in. So so instead of you know 
kind of developing that COVID-15, as we call it, where we gain weight during COVID, we can actually choose to, uh, to develop new routines. And just as I was mentioning before, these routines, uh, in addition to what I mentioned, include when you have that downtime after working and you need a break, instead of turning to your telephone or going on social media, really just take a couple of, of, uh, of walks walk around the neighborhood, put on a mask, walk around the, the area, uh, obviously keep a social distance, but, but, but go, but really try to make that a point. Uh, and, and then, and then also you know, when it comes to, uh, to your pets, for instance, uh, there was recently a New York Times article that said that you don't walk your dogs, but your dogs walk you. So, so there's been a lot of people who have gotten COVID pets. Uh, and I think that's a great way of, of, of of kind of forcing you to get out there, but really, it's just a it's a really important time and a good time to uh, to adopt new behaviors that will change your approach going forward. As you as we, you know, um, soon enough, or you know, hopefully soon enough, we'll we'll exit the pandemic. So just to wrap up, exercise is really a core element to to de to defend ourselves from atherosclerosis. Uh, as we've evolved. We've really evolved into to four ways of approaching uh, physical activity, and that's having really uh, del deleterious effects on our health. And exercise should be something we do on a daily basis. It's the best pill that we have. And uh, as Dr. Gianna has, has mentioned, uh, you should only be exercising on the days that you eat. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Hirsch. That's awesome. Um, excellent uh, overview there. Um, so, you know, I think that th this is really nice to highlight, especially COVID, because it's happened to all of us, you know, myself included. I used to walk to various places throughout the day uh, on a regular basis, uh, go drop off my dry cleaning, then go to the store and then meet friends later and then go to another office. And now we're not going anywhere because not much is happening, unfortunately. So I think that, uh, you know, some people have told me that they've tried to, you know, fit in regular exercise. So they're actually doing a workout three times a week, which is, or four times a week, or whatever it is, which is great. Um, but I think it's also important to keep in mind that your baseline activity of whatever you were doing before is now gone. So you have to almost create that again. You have to just go for more walks. You have to take the stairs. You have to move around your apartment um, just to get that activity in in this COVID era, sadly. But those are really good examples of like where you can find some of these workouts. That's great. Yeah, even online, there's stuff on um, what's it called? Um, uh, what's the name of the website uh, on YouTube, even there's like, you know, free stuff, there's zoom classes, all sorts of stuff that people can do in, you know, to do it during this time. So we do have a number of questions that I definitely want to get to, to make sure that, you know, we align with things that people are interested in hearing about. So there's a few questions about uh, the benefits of aerobic exercise versus working with weights versus yoga. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, those different types of exercise? I'm really glad that that, that that question was raised. Uh, I think that, so so in cardiac rehabilitation, we make sure that patients do get a combination of, uh, of at least for about five to 10 minutes, we try to get them to do stuff, to do work at work with some weights. Um, and the, the more important exercise is aerobic exercise, uh, but it, but, but really, uh, the, the component of, uh, of, of muscle strengthening um, does does appear to add benefits, and it should be part of the the part of your routine if possible. Um, but your workout should be predominantly aerobic if possible. And then as far as yoga, I mean, I, I you know I've done yoga. It's it, it personally from you know it it seems to provide you know uh, exceptional benefits. But uh, I, as far as the data, Dr. Giannis may know more, but I. I, uh, I don't know how much data there is out there, but I'm sure it's forthcoming. And I can only imagine as we start to shift towards prevention and wellness, we'll start to see a lot more of the benefits um, from yoga that we get from a traditional exercise. That's a great point. You know, there are some data 
And I think you may need to mute yours because there's a bit of an echo on mine. It's so unusual. The thing is that uh, there are some recent studies where um, they've looked at, in the past several years, they were presented either in the American College of Cardiology or the AHA meetings uh, when we were there, um, showing the benefits overall. Um, a lot of them are in things like decreasing arrhythmias. A lot of them are in quality of life, at least, um, maybe not as the usual studies that we look at are, you know, longevity and how, you know, whether or not they decrease heart attacks and things like that. But there's definitely um, evidence in yoga and, uh, and and has tremendous benefits. I think also depending on the yoga that you do, if you do things that really do raise your heart rate and you do different things consecutively, it becomes more, to some extent, even aerobic um, if you're doing things in sequence. Uh, and, and yes, there's definitely a lot of benefits. You know, another thing that often comes up is the intensity of exercise where, you know, I think that, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on very vigorous exercise and safety and health in terms of heart disease and negative effects? So this has been a, a trend that's picked up over the last couple of years. These uh, um, high intensity interval training is actually um, the, uh, is one of the more uh, is, is what people know about. And that's, that's something that we, we use. And I actually think it's very beneficial. Um, it's, you know, it, you, you have to use it in the right patients, um, of course, as I mentioned, but it's, uh, it, we, we really do see a lot of the same benefits with high intensity interval training. There's a lot of good data behind it. And, uh, and these can be just short bouts of exercise for 10 minutes. That is, that's quite vigorous. And, and we, we, we do use it in cardiac rehab uh, for, for select patients. And I do recommend it uh, as long as, as you kind of have some guidance. But, uh, but that's a trend that's picked up lately uh, in terms of intensive exercise. Um, you know, there's, with regard to overall intensity of exercise, it's, you know, a lot of it is, uh, is dependent on, um, it, on, whether or not you have limitations. And, and if you start to hurt uh, with, with more vigorous exercise, you, you kind of have to cut back and, and, and do more moderate exercise and, and not risk injuring yourself. So it's, it's, it becomes you know, personalized and, and you know, it becomes intuitive, of course, because um, that's, that's naturally what it does. But, but, uh, but whether it's moderate or intensive exercise, um, it's just a question of, um, of, of number of minutes per week. And with intensive exercise, it can be less minutes per week. With moderate intensity, it can be uh, more minutes per week. Excellent. Um, so yeah, from the standpoint of uh, injury, you're right. You may have to mute again, uh, Ben, sorry. The, the thing is that you wanna be careful, and I myself have like a million joint pains and whatever, and you gotta be careful of what you're doing that may exacerbate injuries from the heart standpoint, I think it's interesting that, yes, the high interval training can really get your heart rate up quick and be very effective for seeing results very quickly. Um, some of the very extreme and, you know, profound exercise where there's, you know, like marathon running and, you know, triath full triathlons and, you know, very intense uh, things. The one thing to keep in mind is that um, what the benefits that Dr. Hirsch is talking about come with really moderate activity. There is not a need to be in the intense, you know, extreme exercise. And to some extent, even in healthy younger individuals, we do see that um, there is, you know, some changes in the heart in terms of like dilatation and some increased risk of atrial fibrillation, which is a irregular heart rhythm. And these people who do, you know, very prolonged, intense, you know, uh, athletic uh, activities, um, not to say that you absolutely can't. Um, and overall, I think that if anything, we tend to shy, you know, towards the extreme of not doing enough exercise, you know, overall, um, it's rare that we run into the opposite um, problem. But, you know, in terms of the cardiac benefits, really just getting the amount of exercise that he mentioned is really what's needed. Somebody asked specifically about vigorous exercise being the most beneficial, but seniors suffer from ailments um, that challenge that discipline. What would you target for a senior specifically? Um, is there any advice that you give to older um, individuals than you would give to the rest of the population? So it's it's a very good question, and it, it really is hard to generalize. And the 
what I would say is that that you it's it's worth it's worth uh, investing uh, in uh, in some sort of structured program, even if it's with a personal trainer um, or it's uh, with you know going to a physical therapist and and kind of understanding uh, different forms of activity. Um, you know, there's these uh, these elastic bands that are very good uh, and uh, for patients who have a lot of joint and mobility problems. Um, the but to, just to have a a formal and uh, a way of, of approaching exercise um, as a start is is important. And so so even if you're not someone with with known heart disease and yet you don't qualify for cardiac rehab or or another type of structured wellness program, you know, having a, a a good prescription from from a health professional um, is a very important way to kind of start and understand how to how to uh, approach your exercise routine. That's great. That's great. Yeah, you definitely want to start somewhere where somebody is guiding you based on your own conditions. You know, some people have, you know, a heart condition, some have high blood pressure, some have joint issues, various things. So definitely getting the guidance of a medical professional and someone who can guide you is important. And I also like your explanations earlier that I think are uh, important. It's like, you know, you're doing moderate activity when you're sweating a little bit and you're having a hard time having a conversation while you're doing that. Like those are markers for you that you're getting enough of a workout that, you know, your body is feeling it, that you'll get the cardiovascular benefit. So that's a good uh, um, advice. And I think that the way you explain also is um, starting slow. So when do people run into trouble most often when they haven't exercised in five years and then they decide that on a cold uh, wintry day, they're going to go shovel snow in the, you know, the, you know, to their absolute um, highest level. So that's where we have problems where somebody is not active and they try to go to extremes abruptly. So I think starting an exercise regimen and gradually building up really does help your body adjust um, well too. So really, really good. And, you know, I feel like a lot of times people are, especially nowadays, because we have the technology, there's so many questions about heart rate because, you know, you know, I was wearing my monitor and it just happened to say that it went to 150, but then normally it's at zero, you know, whatever. Um, people are more in tune with their heart rate, I feel, just because of technology. Do you suggest that people use their heart rate and focus on that in terms of coming up with their targets and their exercise, or how do you guide uh, patients? So that's a very important question. I may, I may kind of talk a bit further and expound on this, but essentially, you know, there's a lot of wearable devices and, and people don't know which device is the best, et cetera. And, and people focus a lot on heart rate as, uh, you know, what should my target heart rate be? And it, it really shouldn't be about heart rate. It really should be um, about, about the level of exercise and the progress you're making in exercise and the consistency you have with exercise. And because you could be on a, for instance, a medication that lowers your heart rate. And what matters is, you know, the difference between the, the starting heart rate and the ending heart rate, which is gonna be lower than someone else. So when it comes to what we do in cardiac rehab is we have patients rate, it's, it's called um, rating of perceived exertion. And we, we take, we see how much they can do um, within a certain, uh, you know, in, on a scale of, of perceived exertion. So if they feel like the, the, they're exerting themselves on a 17, on a scale of 17, then, but then after 12 weeks of, uh, of a structured exercise program, it's down to five. Well, then that's really these kind of goals that we look at. Um, and we look at the, the amount of exercise they can do. Um, so I, I think that target heart rate is is something that uh, that that people strive for. That that really shouldn't be a goal. And uh, um, but what I think is even more important than that, and even though this is controversial, is the number of steps that you take every day. And I think that uh, you know, obviously, if you're doing exercises that are water based or uh, that are, are that are on stationary bikes, et cetera. That's that's not as as indicative, but 
but really what we we, we found is that um, that the number of step, steps is the best way to kind of correlate your activity. And in fact, they're starting to uh, to allow programs that 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 take the number of steps you take from from your last physician office visit and put it into the electronic medical record. And 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 we can we're actually starting to track outcomes that way. And so even if you know there's different reliability in steps from one device to another, it's just the amount of consistency you're doing that's most important to focus on. That's great. I think we focus way too much on the, the heart rate, but you're right, technology can help us in tracking what we've accomplished, how many steps, how much working out, et cetera. Um, yeah, and tracking behavior in and of itself um, has been shown to improve you know, your success, whether it's you're tracking your diet and you're monitoring you know, throughout the week and learning exactly where you're running into trouble or if it's tracking your exercise, your sleep you know, at times. So I think uh, those are good things to be aware of. Uh, some of the other questions we have here, a little bit more related, I think, to food and to other things. Um, one is any specific guidance for someone with type 1 diabetes? And another question is, should I eat before I exercise or after I exercise? I don't know if these are somewhat related, but uh, any uh, advice right there? Yeah, so so th these are kind of more more personalized questions, but but for the most part, uh, you know, we what we do is uh, is we... The insulin requirements for our patients who are doing cardiac rehab, for instance, uh, we are about 10 to 15 percent less um, for when they start to do it. We we check the blood uh, glucose you know, before and after exercise, and uh, and generally you want to you want to eat before exercising. Uh, so that's these are kind of specific questions, but but those are really questions that that should be asked uh, to your physician because everybody's got such a different regimen these days of. Of diabetic medications, but but in general, uh, your your insulin requirements will go down as they should um, when when you exercise. Great. Yes, you want to be careful about not having your sugars drop too much, but working with your professional is a great idea. Your healthcare professional. Um, and then someone asked, since you are recommending steps, how many steps should we be aiming for? So. You know, as as I've said, you know, it's it depends a lot on you. And, and and the point I really want to drive home is that if if you're not doing anything um, and you're just watching this and you haven't moved in a while, the most benefit you get is is really when you go from doing nothing to to, to starting to take a couple of steps per day. I mean, just start with with a few steps. The more you do, the better. And yes, there's a U-shaped curve um, where on the very extreme and those who do triathlon, et cetera, there's, there's some harm, but there's only progressive benefit. Uh, and so it's, it's very unique um, to, and generally we, we recommend 10 to, to 12,000 steps a day, but the more you can do the better. And I, I wouldn't, you know, more than 20 to 25,000, not absolutely necessary. I think there's there's probably um, there's probably less benefit as you start to get into that range, but uh, but the more you can do, the better, and particularly if you're really not moving much at all. Excellent. Yes, even for diet, I think that's the exact same advice we get. Give any change you make along the spectrum in your diet um, is going to be you know, leading to major health benefits. And same thing with exercise, even those small amounts can make a huge difference. Uh, and one other person asked about, you know, at work, whether it makes a difference to have a standing desk versus a sitting desk. Is there health or heart benefits there? You know, it's, it's interesting. It, it, it seems, you know, it, it, a lot of, a lot of people are really uh, utilizing that, especially in, in, uh, amongst large companies and Apple and Google, and they're all having standing desks. And I, it seems to be beneficial. I don't know what the studies are about that, but but I, I guess it 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 promotes behaviors uh, to walk around more. And and you you also have to recognize that it, perhaps it's the recognition of not sitting, and and literally sitting 
as we discussed, is a risk factor for heart disease. So if you're not sitting, that's uh, that's better than sitting. So uh, I think you know that in and of itself is probably um, uh, reducing your risk of heart disease. Excellent. Very good. Um, yeah, and I think one of the things that I'll end on is the fact that you know what you pointed out and you explained all the benefits of exercise in was the um, simple seven, uh, the life simple seven from the American Heart Association, which is seven metrics that everyone should try to strive for in order to reduce heart disease um, that you're bringing up exactly. And, you know, this is something that you can work with your doctor on, you can work with, uh, you know, uh, a trainer, you can work with different people. Um, this is part of what we do in preventive cardiology, though. So Dr. Hirsch was mentioning that he's the co-director for the Lipid Center or the Cardiovascular Prevention Center in Manhasset um, through Northwell. And I do the same in Manhattan and we have different locations in um, the health system. Um, but really working with a program and with a team to make sure you get all of these things under control, like not smoking, working on your weight, physical activity, your diet, getting your cholesterol down, your blood pressure, your sugars, that's the way we reduce heart disease you know, that is essentially the cure. There is not going to likely be a cure in our lifetime, probably not, but this is something that's fully preventable. And if you just think about these and find out what your numbers are and where you fall for all of these different metrics that uh, Dr. Hirsch put up, um, those are things that you want to work on with. And you can certainly work with your own doctor. Um, you can, you know, make an appointment specifically with a preventive cardiologist like Dr. Hirsch. Um, but you want to make sure that you've done everything you can uh, to improve those metrics. Um, and we're going to continue to uh, hold these uh, conferences every month to bring different topics uh, that are relevant, hopefully, to all of our audiences. And you know, we're open to ideas of what you want to hear about. Um, we'll bring in different experts each time. And um, the next topic that we're going to have in November is actually going to be the anti-diet approach living to, to living your healthiest. And that's with uh, Sharon Zarabi, one of our excellent uh, dietitians. Um, so that'll be very important as we approach the holidays that we move into an anti-diet uh, lifestyle um, to, to really stay healthy. Um, so Dr. Hirsch, thank you very much for joining us tonight on this topic. We really appreciate it. And thank you for having me. Thank you. And we will be posting these on social media, in um, on Twitter, on um, Instagram, and on Facebook. So you'll know um, about our upcoming conferences. We'll also try to post the recordings as well um, in different places so that you can access them. Um, but we thank you so much for joining. And we hope that you will take steps to improve your own heart health and join us in the future. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Hirsch.